Hello and welcome to Adult Music, the podcast with music for the mature mind. It's episode 170. I'm your co-host, Russ. And I'm your co-host, Mike. And I think my mind is maturing all the time. I'm actually kind of excited about this. You look pretty mature over there, Mike. I might actually be an adult one day. Whenever you grow up. <laughs> yeah, it'll happen. And it's deja vu again this week with another rainy Sunday night. Oh, it's been rainy, yeah. It's been rainy for a good deal of the week, actually. Although we did have some nice, beautiful days in the middle of the week. But that's given us some extra time for music listening, and we yes, never complain about that. We're going to get rolling right into things this episode here. I want to start out with some thank yous. First of all, thanks to guitarist Andrew Scott for writing to us after checking out our discussion of his recording with trombonist Kelsey Grant from last week's episode. The recording was called Horizon Song on Cellar Live. It's a really great recording with guitar and trombone sharing the spotlight. If you haven't heard it, be sure to go and check it out. There's links to it in our episode from last week. Also want to give a big thanks to bassist Richard Anderson for his kind comments and for sharing our episode on Facebook. You've got to check out that recording, Wah, on Hobby Wah. Horse Records. Yeah, he told us how to pronounce it, which I thought was cool. Richard Anderson on bass and the great Danish pianist Carl Winter along with drum powerhouse Jeff Tane Watts. So make sure you go back and check that out. It's a really exciting recording. Before we get into the rest of the episode, we've got a little bad news this, this week. This is very bad news. This one definitely deserves the theme, so go ahead, Russ. Okay, I'll get over to the piano here. Yeah. Belgian soprano and adult music favorite Jody DeVos died of breast cancer on June 16th at the age of 35 in Paris. Oh, That's young. so young. She was just at the beginning of her career. And it happened actually last week while we were recording the podcast, or maybe not at that time, but that day. Right. And this is really sad because 35 for a singer is just when you're in the peak of your career. You're going to go there until you're around 50. And that's when your voice is at its peak level and we've lost her. Now, she performed as recently as April 30th at the Théâtre de Champs-Élysées in Paris, but her condition deteriorated rapidly. And on this podcast, we first heard her uh, via her album And Love Said way back on episode six, Boats, Scooters, Turtlenecks Music. She was the turtleneck right. of that title. And the funny thing is with that title, I kind of can name all three of those albums because I remember what they were. Right. That was on March 22nd, 2021. And again, she was the soprano in Pergolesi's Stavat Mater on episode 57. The Revolution will not be organized. That's a really complicated title. You have to see that one. On April 4th, 2022. And again, she was on Quatuor Vos's album, Poetique de l'Instant, on episode 71, A Breeze from Brazil, on July 11th, 2022. But it was really her album of Offenbach Colorature, uh, released by Alpha in early 2019, long before we were doing the podcast, that really turned me on to her artistry. And that's the album I'd recommend people hear, Offenbach Colorature. Her soprano voice soars into the stratosphere beautifully on that album, and I made sure to remember her name afterwards. So that's why she's on such an early podcast of ours. When I, that came out, I really jumped at it. There were real vocal fireworks on it, highly recommended. I thought this would be an entertaining voice to follow throughout her career, but it ended way too soon. Her third and final solo album was Bijou Perdu for the Alpha label, which we didn't cover, unfortunately, because I figured, out oh, we had done the um, Debussy and then the Pergolesi, and then this came out, and I said, ah, oh, we'll get her on the next one. And now, sadly, there's not going to be a next one. Who knew? Yeah. So that album, Bijou Perdu, was a tribute to the 19th century Belgian coloratura soprano Marie Cabelle. And Jody Davos, we miss you already. I hope she'll rest in peace. All right, other than that bad news there, we don't have any special good news to report, so we'll jump right into the program. We've got a really good lineup this week. Six releases as usual, three classical and three jazz. And in the episode description, you'll find links to Spotify, Apple Music, and Amazon Music for all the music that we'll discuss. Also at the top of the description, there's a link to the full episode playlist. That's all the music in one place on Deezer, CD quality streaming music from France can also listen to the podcast on Deezer if you want to get everything in one place. Now, wherever you listen to us, if you can't see the full description or the recording list and the links are not easy to access, please come over and check us out on our host site. That's podbean, P-O-D-B-E-A-N.com. 
Everything is easy to follow there. If you enjoy the podcast, please follow or subscribe wherever you listen to us. Tell a music-loving friend as well. Help us grow our audience. If you take a moment to give us a ranking or write a short review, that helps us get listed in the music category recommendations, and it's another way that we can find new listeners. Come over and follow us on our Facebook page as well to get extra info and new releases throughout the week. It was a big Friday of jazz releases, so there's a few new ones up there that we may or may not get into an episode. On Facebook, you can leave a message or comment, see our interaction with the musicians, and of course, see our handsome faces. If you'd like to contact us directly with any comments or questions, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is adultmusicpodcasts, all one word, at gmail.com. Another podcast we'd like to recommend to you is The Same Difference, Two Jazz Fans, One Jazz Standard Podcast that's run by our friends AJ and Johnny, who look at several versions of One Jazz Standard in each episode. They play little samples from each version, talk about the history with a lot of humor, and then they give you their opinions on what they like and don't like. It's always a lot of fun. There's a link to their podcast in the description. And if you stick around to the end of this episode, you can hear their audio promo. We play a lot of music samples as we discuss things as well. And this is our fair use disclaimer. Music sample clips are for commentary and educational purposes. We recommend that listeners listen to the complete recordings, all of which are available on the streaming services in the links provided. And we also suggest that if you enjoy the music, you consider purchasing the CDs or high quality downloads to support the artists. All right, where are we going to start with the classical music this week, Mike? Okay, so we've got an album with a very positive title, The Muse is Restored. Oh, how I would love to see The Muse is Restored. Yes. Anyway. Bring them back. This album promises us that they're there. Okay, and this is by another favorite artist of ours, Rachel Podger. I've been listening to her since around the 2000s, really, the mm. late 2000s, and she just never ceases to impress and does so on this album, too. So this is uh, Rachel Podger, a uh, bridge baroque violinist. Okay, so she's using a period instrument and playing with the Brecon Baroque. And they are Reiko Ichise on the six-string bass viol, Felix Knecht on the cello, Elizabeth Kenny on the theorbo, arch lute, baroque guitar, ten course lute, and seven course lute. She's an artist that figures on a lot of these albums. Mm -hmm. And Marcin Sviatkovich on the harpsichord and organ. So it's a sort of small ensemble, but there's a lot of timbral color in there. This is on the Channel Classics label, released on May 24th. Man, what's today? June 23rd? We're almost a month right. behind with yeah. this one. But I had to uh, include it because it's so great. Okay, so the program, The Muse is Restored, is described as a journey of captivating violin-led chamber music from Jacobean to early Georgian England, ranging from the gentle intimacy of consort idioms to the full-blown instrumental virtuosity of the evolving Baroque period. Jonathan Freeman Atwood, the producer of the album, describes the music as beautifully refined and intimately chiseled. And I have to say, that's a really good yeah. <laughs> description of what we're going to hear. Beautifully refined and intimately chiseled. Rachel Podger titles her article on the program, A Riotous Joy to Play. Okay, well, I'm in. <laughs> Let's uh, yeah. just dive right in here. The first four tracks are a work by a composer known to us all, George Friedrich Handel, he of Messiah fame. This is his Sonata in D major, HWV 371, Opus 1, number 13. It's a four-movement work. The first movement is Affettuoso, and this starts beautifully with a single harpsichord chime and Podge's by now recognizable tone. Thick but light, she bows with a sort of weighty slowness, drawing out the note and slowing time, and that's one of the things I love about her playing. And I really love the way this sounds, so let's just hear a sample of that right away. That cadence just doesn't come. I really love her whole quality of stretching out the note in time. It's kind of like, oh, you're just getting out of bed in the morning and stretching and it just feels so good. I just love it. Okay, now the second movement is Allegro. 
It's lighter in tone than the opening, but Padres Allegro's never race, and this is in keeping with her artistry. It's crisp and clear, and virtuosic in the right places. Padre never shows off, and she's very musical in her playing, and rarely will she like play something virtuosically to just show her ability. But she has it. It's all there, and it's all at the service of the music. I just love it so much. This uh, movement breathes perfectly. Let's hear the opening. There's that virtuosity towards the end. Not showy, but just very musical all the way through. I just love her playing. The third movement, Ladigo. A slow, chiming harpsichord accompanies Podger's searching melody. I like the way she shades her tone towards softer dynamics at the end of phrases. There's an open cadence leading to the Allegro, track four, and movement four, which has a Baroque dance quality to it with rushing violin lines. The harpsichord plays figuration at times two, it's a good tempo, not rushed, and we're sort of used to that from hearing all of those Rachel Podger recordings over the years. At a minute and 37 seconds, the harpsichord changes to a drier, more staccato sound briefly, but is soon back to its chiming sound when the opening material repeats. Tracks 5 through 7, William Laws, Fantasia Suite number 8 in D major. The first movement is labeled Fantasia, and the continuo here is an organ, and that's uh, Marcin Sviatkovich again on the organ. It gives an ancient sound with what I'm guessing is a woodwind setting on the organ. I like smaller organs like this, where you can hear the mechanism opening and releasing the air from the pipes. It's appealing and light by itself, but Padre and a cello, and I'm guessing that's Felix Knecht, soon come in and both duet and play in counterpoint. Let's sample this from around the three minute mark. We'll go into it a little bit. This has a relaxed tempo and breathes perfectly again. After the midway point, the rest of Brecon Baroque come in to add a variety of timbres, always keeping the movement gently appealing. Track six is the second movement, Alman, so that's an Alemand, subtitled La Goutte. It sounds like there are both a bass, viol, and a cello at the beginning. The organ blends in and the violin plays the theme as the cello occasionally answers. This also has a relaxed tempo, breathes deeply, and features some subtle timbres, appealing melodies in this movement too. And track seven is Galliard. That's the third and final movement of the Fantasia Suite. It's a charming dance melody, played on the slow side, and therefore at a danceable tempo. Character of the dance is well caught in the rhythm and phrasing. Track eight, John Blow, British composer, ground in G minor. This features perhaps a Baroque guitar. It's strummed, and the bass viol, or a cello, plays a theme that the violin then comes in to take over. The bass viol, I'm pretty sure that's what it is, is playing the ground theme as the violin plays variations over that. The violin basically winds around the same theme in different registers, adding decorations and ornamentation. Let's get a sample of this with the bass viol and Baroque guitar.
know, now that I'm hearing it closely through the headphones, I'm thinking it's a cello. Anyway, tracks 9 through 16, Matthew Locke, Little Consort in Two Parts, titled For Several Friends in C Minor and Major, from 1656. This is an eight-movement work. The first movement, track 9, is Fantasia. The harpsichord and cello are back. The cello plays a counter melody to the violin. There are some dissonant passing tones that add spice to the lines. These are all brief pieces. Track 10 is the second movement, Pavan, a slower rhythm subtly taken with some emotion in the melody. The accompaniment here is some kind of lute. I don't know which, but it's played by Elizabeth Kenny. Let's hear this movement as a sample. It's a nice statement of the opening theme. Track 11, the third movement, Air. This has a bass viol and lute in the continuo as the violin plays the song-like theme. Track 12, a fourth movement, Courant. It's a flowing courant, very brief, with an appealing melody. I will briefly sample that as well. That's about half of the work right there. Track 13 is a saraband. This is the fifth movement. It's very brief at 27 seconds and moves very fast for a saraband. Track 14 is the sixth movement, Air. The violin is in lyrical mode again as the cello plays the counter melody underneath with the harpsichord holding down the harmony. Track 15 is the seventh movement, Courant, brief and lively with a bounce to the downbeat. And track 16, the eighth and final movement, is another saraband. And we have another one here. It's as fast as the previous one. Now, sarabands are usually slow in stately dances. So apparently the saraband had a different feel in England than it did in continental Europe. It originated in Spain, apparently. There's a Baroque guitar accompanying. It feels like a light stepping dance here. At the 45 second mark, a more saraband-like rhythm traveling through molasses appears and leads to a cadence. Track 17, Henry Purcell, or Purcell. <laughs> Scholars have messed up the pronunciation of his name. I don't know how to say it anymore. Sonata in... I always say Purcell. Anyway, Sonata in G minor, Z780. This is the first movement only. We don't hear the rest of the work. Just the first movement. This features the organ again in continuo, and it's constructed like a church sonata, which is slow, fast, slow, fast. A customary structure in Purcell's music. At 2 minutes and 54 seconds, the Allegro starts and has the lively style I associate with Purcell. At 4 minutes and 7 seconds, the Largo starts and the Continuo suddenly leaves a lot of space. I like the light plucking of what could be a Theorbo or Arch Lute played by Elizabeth Kenny. The violin and cello weave counter melodies here. The final Vivace has a generous bounce to it, lively and cheerful. The organ adds some fluty sounds to the melody too. I'm going to sample this from about the six minute mark. We'll hear it right to the end.
Nice. Track 18, Johann Schoep, Lacrimé. A lute played by Elizabeth Kenny accompanies the violin in this light lament. It's got a light sadness to it. Let's sample the opening. that cadence is being withheld again so we'll go out there podger's approach lightens the piece and makes it a pleasure to listen to as it goes on it goes through different figuration patterns as in a set of variations tracks 19 through 21 john jenkins fantasy a suite in a minor vdgs group four number one the first movement of this on track 19, titled Fantasia, has some ear-catching dissonance from the organ at the beginning. Let's hear that. There are so many pleasures on this album that I just don't know where to stop. Here we go. The violin and then the bass viol come in, imitating the organ's opening, and this fantasia proceeds as a bit of a lament. It's very slow, with long sustained lugubrious notes, especially from the bass viol, played by Reiko Ichise. It's appealing when the bass viol and violin play counter melodies against each other, each offering a pleasing sound. There are repeated melodic patterns traded back and forth that catch the ear and guide the listener through the piece. Tambral combinations change to violin, cello, and organ in the fourth minute. The second movement on track 20 is air, a bright but slow opening to this air. The cello's double stops have the effect of opening the space up at the beginning. In the first minute, the tempo quickens and bounces a bit. The air goes through different orchestrations and approaches. It's slow again in the second minute. We're back to a bouncier approach in the third minute with figuration added to both violin and cello. Track 21, the third and final movement is a courant. It sounds like an arch lute at the opening. There's an organ in there too once the violin enters. This is a courant that glides instead of quickly stepping. The violin is given some quick ornamentation in its variations on the theme. From tracks 22 through 26, we get a medley of works by different composers. Track 22, Thomas Baltzar, prelude from The Division Violin, published in 1688. The violin plays solo here. It starts with melodic lines that are double stopped at times. Let's hear the opening. It's affectionately played by Podger. some real teases there. I think the cadence was coming just as they faded out. The piece proceeds as melodic variations on the opening theme. Track 23, Francesco Barsanti, Locaber, from a collection of old Scots tunes. Here the violin is accompanied by perhaps an arch lute or theorbo and cello. The tune stands out as Scottish in its phrasing and melody, even though it's written by an Italian. I guess he was um, collecting tunes in <laughs> Scotland. 
Track 24, Henry Purcell again. Lille Bourlero, Z646, a new Irish tune, published in 1686. This tune has a triplet feel and more movement to it. It's played solo on the harpsichord for the first statement. Then a theorbo comes in to accompany. For the third statement, cello and violin both come in. It's an entertaining arrangement, pleasant for the ear and mind. Track 25, James Oswald, Alloway House from a curious collection of Scots tunes. This is played on the cello at the opening. The violin accompanies with sustained chords on this track, and again, the Scottish quality of the melody is apparent. Track 26, Francesco Gemignani, another Italian, from his collection, two airs for a violin or German flute, violin, cello, and harpsichord from A Treatise of Good Taste in the Art of Music, published in 1749. This is a tune called Old Bob Morris, Affettuoso Allegro, and this sounds Scottish as well. The violin plays the opening solo. A lute gently comes in to accompany. Let's sample this and get a little bit of that Scottish theme in our ears. Tracks 27 through 29, the final piece on the album, Richard Jones, Chamber Airs for a Violin and Thorough Bass, Opus 2, Number 4, in A minor from 1735. So we're squarely in the high Baroque era now. Track 27, the first movement, Preludio, Largo. Cello and violin have a melody over a theorbo and harpsichord continuo. Padre is at her most emphatic in this piece. Yet she's still polished enough that you cannot imagine strands of her hair falling out of place over her eyes. She plays with poise throughout the album, and in this piece too. There are some sighing dissonances at 1 minute and 39 seconds. There are quite a few chromatic approaches to key notes. Track 28 is the second movement, Allegro. This has a dancing quality, with the cello acting as a continuo, along with the harpsichord and lute. Padre is also emphatic in this movement, with its constant accented double stops. Bowed bass viol and theorbo have an intro of a sustained chord into the next movement, which is a giga allegro. This is the third movement, track 29. It's a lively ending to the album, and Padre plays out here with lots of energy. She's still got that gauzy attack, though, so everything sounds comfortable to the ear. Let's sample the last track. So, if you like what you've heard, there's a lot of it. This album is an hour and 20 minutes long, and by now I have so many recordings by Rachel Padra, and I never tire of hearing her. This was, as expected, a rewarding album, and not least for the music that's new to me, which is most of it. The tempos chosen aren't really slow, as deeply breathed, and giving the feeling of a slow tempo. It makes the recording feel relaxed, and that appealed to me. Add to that the different timbres, changing with each piece and introduced subtly to the mix, and you have a rewarding Baroque recording. The entire recording comes across as light and pleasant. Padra doesn't seem to have an aggressive approach in her musical arsenal, and I'm not complaining. I find her playing so subtly unique that I never tire of listening to her, as I said. She has a quality to her approach that's subtly uplifting to the listener, and you can hear that quality all over this album. It's an album that I highly recommend and is in the running for my best of the year. How many times have I said that this year? Not too many. One slight disappointment for me, this album is on CD, but not on Super Audio CD, and most of Podger's earlier recordings for the last 15 years or so have been on uh, Channel Classic Super Audio CD. I'm wondering why they changed that. 
Eh, no matter. We don't get the five channels, but we do get some amazing music making. There's a lot of contrast in the style of the composers and in the instrumentation throughout the works. I really liked the bass viol addition in the ensemble. It adds a thickness and a kind of edge to the sound that I found enjoyable. As you mentioned, it's a fine sounding recording with both detail and warmth. And so you get drawn into the music and played with both sensitivity and flair by Podger and her associates here. And it gave me kind of a renewed respect for the English Baroque tradition that we don't often focus on. Everything's Italian and other places, yeah. but we can realize there was interesting music and very pleasing melodies coming from all over the place. Yeah, well, we get a lot of Baroque Italian because I'm doing the programming. <laughs> I really like that. Yeah, But yeah, there are plenty of recordings of uh, English Baroque and German Baroque and even French Baroque, and we get to those too. I have an ear for the Italian though. I like those Scottish melodies too. They were really charming. Yeah, I did too. Okay, next, a real discovery. The music of Florent Schmidt. He's French from the Lorraine region, lived 1870 to 1958. This is an album featuring his work La Tragédie de Salomé. Salomé of the Bible, of course, the uh, Dance of the Seven Veils, Salome. And also his brief Chant Elegiac at the end, performed by the Frankfurt Radio Symphony with Alain Altenoglu as the conductor. This is on the Alpha label, released on May 10th. Yeah, it was quite a while ago. I've been sitting on this. But I remember this name because he's often mentioned, along with Debussy and Ravel, as one of those composers from that era that we don't hear enough of. And I jumped at the chance uh, to hear this. Didn't get to program it until today. Tracks 1 through 22 are all La Tragédie de Salomé, Opus 50, from 1907. The 1907 version is the original version of the score. It's been 30 years since this work has been recorded. It was first recorded on the Naxos label in 1991 in a performance conducted by Patrick Davin. La Tragédie de Salomé was a mimed drama danced by Louis Fuller. Schmidt composed this after his travels to Morocco and Turkey. The director of the small Théâtre des Arts in Paris, Robert Dumier, had just completed a poetic, dramatic, and symbolic literary text intended as a reaction against Richard Strauss's recently staged opera Salomé. And he requested this score from Schmidt. And it's quite a score, let me tell you. Yeah. Track one is the prelude, and it's got some astonishing sounds, according to the booklet notes. It proclaims its oriental setting through two languorously sinuous melodies that immediately establish the atmosphere of suspicion and lechery described in the libretto. The entry of the trombone in the low register signals the appearance of John the Baptist, so he's always going to have those solemn brass representing him in this piece. It starts with some cloudy harmony at the beginning, that places this squarely in the modernist era when it was composed. Fantastic low brass provide bass along with the double basses. There's a fantastic bassoon melody in the opening minute. Gauzy string and wind harmonies haunt the next minute or so. There's a lot of subtlety to the scoring. The texture suddenly changes at 3 minutes and 28 seconds with an eighth note pulsing chord rhythm that melts away at minute 4. There's a big crescendo at the fifth minute complete with harp glissandi that evokes not only the oriental setting, but the entire pre-war 20th century sound aesthetic in orchestral music. I'm going to sample from that section, but I think you should hear this entire movement, and really this entire work, but this movement sets such a great atmosphere that I really want to encourage mm. you to hear all of it. Anyway, here it is from the fifth minute. Now, he repeats that theme over and over again because he knows that we're listening to all of the, the sumptuous <laughs> scoring around it. And he really yeah. wants to make sure that we pick that up. The exotically perfumed scoring continues, and at around 8 minutes and 24 seconds, there's one of those sudden key changes. 
that I associate with Debussy that leads to the entry of brass in the ninth minute in its low end and the ominous presence of John the Baptist. We hear his instrument, the trombone, beginning at the 9 minute and 35 second mark. We get a big brass statement just before the movement ends. Track 2, Deuxième Tableau. The themes linked to the three other characters, Herod in the first violins, Herodias in the clarinet, and Salome in the second violins, are heard here. The second tableau starts seamlessly after the prelude with a leaping staccato violin line. That's Herod's line. There's a brass fanfare at a minute and 26 seconds. The clarinet eventually emerges out of the brass chords at the two-minute mark, representing Herodias, Herod's wife, and the line is sinewy and winding. We hear the trombone again, playing a brief melody. Then after the three-minute mark, Salome's theme in the second violins. Let's sample that. And you noticed in there that the clarinet came in to interfere. That's Herodias. And then we heard hmm. John the Baptist trombone as well, building up in power at the end. So there's a lot of drama in the music as well as the mimed dance. The theme sounds innocent enough here, but quickly starts escalating to reach for higher keys. Great clouds of harmony accompany. Track three, troisième tableau. What follows in the performance is not a single scene of seduction but a series of six choreographic episodes highlighting Salome's various refined poses and multicolored projections as a fairy of lights, according to the notes, that's in quotation marks, fairy of lights, and evoking different facets of the girl's personality in tandem with the silent drama's compelling development from animated tableau to apocalyptic epilogue via a demonic phantasmagoria. Oh, whoever wrote these booklet notes has quite a vocabulary. <laughs> Anyway, this starts lightly with strings and a sparkling harp figure. This section acts as an introduction to the next movement. It's a brief at a minute and beautifully scored. There's a pause, and then we get track four, marked Vif. This light-footed pizzicato section is the first of three initial dances by Salome. Here, in the Dance of the Pearls, which is not labeled on the track list, there's a bit of a problem with this, by the way, on this album. The track list doesn't seem to match the notes in certain sections. Mm. I'll get to that. Salome shows herself as carefree and coquettish. The cellos start the pizzicato dance. It comes across as rather crazed, but builds into a grand crescendo. And at the 38 second mark, we get the coquettish rhythm, which I will sample right now. Great harmonies there, too. They're sort of mm -hmm. a little acerbic, but they're in the wind, so you don't really notice it all that much. Gorgeous orchestration follows, and some striking sounds in the winds as well, including those that we just heard there. The strings get the swooping coquettish theme at about the 2 minute and 30 second mark. There are great high, shrill wind sounds at the end of the movement. Track 5, Quatrième Tableau. This is a short intro to the upcoming Dance of the Peacock. It's hazy and sustained. The bassoon again gets the spotlight in a satisfying way in the first minute. Great washes of string harmony follow. And then in track six, we hear the Danse du Paon, introduction to the dance of the peacock. In this slow and pompous dance, Salome shows herself as proud and haughty. 
The intro starts with puffed up brass lines moving to strings as the melody moves up in range. The theme descends and we go to the actual dance, track seven. Let's hear this, the proud and haughty dance of the peacock. I believe that's an English horn that we just heard at the end. Great reedy sound. Nice tone, yeah. There's a recognizable three-note figure, dun, da 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 that we keep hearing in this uh, dance. It's sequenced often in this particular section. Uh, there are moments of dreamy, gauzy harmony as well, then a crescendo ending in trilled winds and puffed-up string figures. The winds play the theme in the second minute. The theme is grandly stated in the third minute and again at the end of the movement. Track 8, Sankiem Tableau. That's the fifth tableau. This starts with soft, gauzy string harmony, luscious for the ear. There's a sudden key change and then a hushed theme at a minute and 30 seconds that builds up. We hear a bit of the trombone representing John the Baptist, after which the string themes take over and diminuendo to some gorgeous, quiet brass chords at the end. A timpani roll leads to track 9, Danse de Serpente, the Dance of the Serpents introduction. This dance is full of contrast, and Salome here shows herself as sensual and malevolent. Track 9 is a brief intro to the dance, and it features menacing, rapidly bowed string chords and a brass theme in the low end of the orchestra. Some bass drum rolls come in from deep in the earth, sounding great in the subwoofer, shaking the room. And then we get to track 10, the main dance of the serpents, which I'm going to sample as well. Some fantastic orchestration there, and that clarinet is really serpent like. Uh, it has a light, sinewy, teasing line. It's got a rising and falling rapid tail end, making it sound teasing and sensuous. The menace in the brass and percussion are palpable. It's a great recording, too, of these instruments. The oboe gets a solo at a minute and 50 seconds, an attractive melody. Then a new key is started, and the strings play the oboe's theme. The strings play the theme and heighten the tension and bring the movement to an end. Track 11, 6 m Tableau, the sixth. This marks a turning point in the mimed drama, which now takes on a symbolic dimension. Herod and Herodias are convinced that they can see their past crimes reflected in the waters of the Cursed Sea, which is the Dead Sea, as if in a magic mirror. The tableau starts with subdued strings and shimmering repeated notes in the rapidly bowed strings. This track is very brief at a minute and nine seconds. Then we get to track 12, Les Enchantements Sous la Mer, Enchantments on the Sea. An unusual impressionistic section for Schmidt, it makes discreet reference to Debussy, whose La Mer had only been heard two years before. Schmidt evokes the cursed sea with an omnipresent theme suffused with whole tone tonality. And that's really what makes this sound like Debussy a lot. The opening has a hushed sort of magic to it as rapidly bowed strings play a short theme. The Debussy reference is pretty obvious here. It's in the orchestral sound overall. I'm going to sample this at about the one minute mark.
those shimmering strings at the end. So much uh, orchestral color, very delicate orchestral color in this movement. At the one minute mark, the thematic material starts to take shape. The movement remains on the quiet side, and there's some real orchestral magic here. In the third minute, we get more La Mer-like melodic shapes, near the Debussy work, in other words. There's a huge crescendo. Then, track 13, Anime, a brief movement that acts as an introduction to the Dance of Steel, which is track 14, Danse de l'Acier. Salome reappears cold and cruel. This was cut in the 1910 revision of this work, together with the two preceding dances. From now on, the music is rough, chopped up, full of energy, moving gradually towards a more frankly voluptuous atmosphere that culminates in return to Salome's baleful malevolence. Let's hear the Danse de l'Acier, because it's actually pretty important. It comes back later in the work. <laughs> And as you heard, that bass drum is, comes across so vividly on the recording. It's more of a chest cavity sound than it is an <laughs> ear sound. I really love when that happens, actually. The music evokes a steely hardness, easy to hear and sense. This is pretty brief at a minute and 32 seconds. The section remains heavy throughout. Track 15, marked anime, has a lightning of atmosphere in the 50-second section as the tempo gradually speeds up. It's dance-like and crescendos to a climax and change of direction, leading quietly to track 16, Lente mais chaleureux et soutenu, which is a musical direction, really. This section is rather mournful in tone. Let's get a sample of that. Under those wind lines, you want to notice that the strings are playing a legato, or more connected version of the Dance of Steel theme. We should get that in our ears. We're going to hear a lot of it. Track 17, Anime, a brief transition, lasting a minute and 11 seconds, with a sensual, sustained string tone dominating. Brass takes over at the end, the sound of John the Baptist. Track 18, Vif, Mouvement de la Danse Joyeuse. The clarinet plays the staccato dancing melody, and that's Herodias again, so she's, I guess, pretty happy here. Let's hear this. Next, a really remarkable section. Now it's labeled Chant de Lea, but in the notes it's called Song of Isa. So I'm not really sure what to make of this. I think the writer of the booklet notes wasn't following the same track list as the one that's printed <laughs> be, yeah. in the CD book. Yeah, these uh, seem to have different names. And But I checked the French too, and it says Chant de Isa <laughs> in the notes and not Alea, so I'm not really sure what's happening here. Anyway, it doesn't matter because the song is what it is. It's an authentic oriental melody that inspired both librettist and composer when it was published in an article in the Paris journal Mercure Musical on 15 July 1906, in which Salvatore Petavi, writer and traveler, 
transcribed a few snatches of a slow winding melody sung by his guide on the shores of the Dead Sea. As transformed by Schmidt, this air initially heard, sung by a seductive woman's voice, marks an extraordinary listening moment. And this actually features a woman's voice singing a vocalese. It's rather distant at first and has a Middle Eastern flavor. The strings then play the theme, and I'm going to move in to where that happens at around the 55 second mark. It's extraordinary to hear a vocal in this work yeah, after all surprising. of that. Yeah, very surprising. Uh, the voice comes back at the end, this time with string accompaniment, and there's a buildup of tension right at the end with the strings circling leading to the dance. Track 20, Danse Blanche, which is referred to as the silver dance in the English translation. In French, it means the white dance. I don't know what they're doing here. The booklet notes seem not to be following the track listing at several points. The melody is an expanded version of two elements from the Chant d'Alea, or Aisa. The ornamented pattern becomes an expressive impulse of the girl's new mood of perverse lasciviousness. To flashing lights, the action intensifies. Let's hear a sample of that. There's something circusy about this dance, despite the fact that it's played mostly by strings. It's brief at a minute and nine seconds and serves to build up tension to John the Baptist's beheading. There's a gong at the end, and the music stops after a string line ends. Track 21, Très Lente, John the Baptist is beheaded here, and Salome seizes the head and hurls it into the cursed sea on its blood-covered platter, while the orchestra depicts all the wild tumult of the scene. This starts with mournful brass chords. The brass dwindles via a decrescendo. Then we hear swirling strings and a pounding section at a minute and 54 seconds. The highly perfumed string harmonies return piano in the second minute. The brass are gorgeous in this movement and they play mournfully to the end. And then track 22, the final track, the final section of this score, Danse de l'Effroi, the Dance of Fear. In this frenetic section, the head of John the Baptist rises up and multiplies, and the tension reaches its climax. The prophet's motif and Salome's cold and cruel motif of steel both reappear, and the terrified, delirious Salome spins on her own axis before the final cataclysmic moment, in which we're not told what happens. But <laughs> the brass are interrupted by frenetic outbursts to the percussion and strings, and keep returning. A dotted eighth note rhythm establishes itself during the first minute. Then all sorts of gongs accent a more dramatic string line. The work ends on a brief build-up to an accentuated staccato chord. There's one more piece, track 23, Chant Elegiac, Opus 24. This work was originally planned for cello and piano. Between 1899 and 1903, it was orchestrated in 1911. This piece has nothing dance-like about it, nor any hint of Orientalism, so it's a complete contrast to the very long piece that we just heard. It is, according to the booklet notes, pure, absolute musical melancholy. Melancholy it is. It starts with a lovely strings and harp. The cello comes in at the 22nd mark and plays a meltingly gorgeous melody. I'm going to sample this from the cello's entry.
Ah, gorgeous. The orchestration features strings sometimes glinting in their high vibratoless ends to accentuate points in the melody. The music has a heavy, lugubrious quality and is beautifully scored. There's a brief crescendo just before the three-minute mark that releases some tension, but the tempo speeds up a bit, giving the cello some room to move. There's another tension buildup. Again, some gorgeous sensual harmony in the fourth minute. The texture lightens in the fifth minute, exposing the cello as it moves from its high end downward. Another big string buildup climaxes at 5 minutes and 44 seconds. There's a decrescendo, and the piece ends on some melancholy, quiet harmony. What a fantastic, colorful score Tragedie de Salome is. Where has this been? It was a sensual pleasure to listen to, as was Chantal Giac, which provided a more song-like kind of sensual orchestration. Like Guillaume Lecu, Florent Schmidt is a name from the modernist era one doesn't hear much, and on the strength of this recording, you have to wonder why not. Lecu died in his 20s, but Schmidt lived well beyond the war to 1958. This is the kind of album that could kindle new interest in the composer's works. It's beautifully recorded, and the harmonies and orchestration put one squarely in the pre-World War I era. All sensuality and hazy harmony. I love the feelings it all evokes. I guess you could say that, as with last week's John Cage album, an element is missing, and again, it's the dancers, to complete the drama, but this score is a pleasure to listen to on its own, even though it requires the drama to play out in the mind's eye. This album is a real sensual pleasure. Let's have more recordings of Florent Schmidt's works given this kind of attention, please. The Salome is a real timbre feast. English horn, oboe, flute, and clarinet kept drawing my ear, but there's a lot of warm brass and percussion, and the moods change rapidly. There are plenty of rhythmic passages, too, and I imagine that's for the dance, which would have been interesting to see. But I'm happy to hear the complete work, since the notes refer to this reduced suite version. And I liked the Chant Elysiac as well. It's quite lovely, with the cello in the upper register, and those tones are surrounded by the full, rich sounds of the orchestra. All of this French timbral feast is good for the ears, and I'd like to hear more from this composer as well. Yeah, I think there's a lot of his music out there. And I suspect that he suffered the fate of uh, many composers who were composing in dodecaphonic style right. after the, <laughs> the war. The 20th century, yeah. Because he lived into 1958, and by that time, any kind of writing like that would have been <laughs> yeah. out, which is a shame. Well, we can rediscover it now. Our final classical album is the contemporary composer for this week, Yuri Reinvera. He's Estonian, born in 1971. I'm not sure I said his name correctly. I hope I did. This is an album called Ship of Fools. It mirrors one of the pieces on the album. This is by the Estonian Festival Orchestra, conducted by Pavo Yervi, and we are in very good hands here with Pavo Yervi at the helm. This is also on the Alpha label, released on May 17th, 2024. Reinvera is described in the notes as one of the great instrumental storytellers of our time. Interesting. Storyteller. Hmm. I don't know about that, but I'll have something to say about what he's evoking in these works, let's say. We should keep that in mind, nevertheless, that his work has a narrative quality to the way it progresses. It doesn't really progress. I think the way it expresses itself, let's say. Tracks one through three, the first work is called, And Tired from Happiness, They Started to Dance. Well, that's a pretty interesting title. <laughs> it's very evocative right away. We have a mental image that might be a little startling. This is described as powerful and exhilarating. It's similar to Debussy's La Mer in its external form. It's got three movements, but the character of the music is different. Reinvede had been reflecting on the late theories of the American philosopher and cultural critic George Steiner, according to whom Europe had grown tired of culture and was suffocating under the weight of its own history. I picked this up too when I was in school. I was hearing things like this too. This work describes with sensual opulence various stages of fatigue and a sense of emptiness in the midst of overabundance. When Pavo Yervi requested this piece, he said he wanted something that unleashes the dance's energy. Reinvera combines rhythmic explosiveness with the volcanic power of the brass sections, reminiscent of Anton Bruckner, and the sparkling virtuosity of the strings and woodwinds inspired by Ravel. The first movement, track one, is titled Shadows in the Mirror. It starts with rushing upward strings, 
and some subtle swirling woodwind. I'm going to sample this from around the 30 second mark when it gets going a little bit. And I really want to get to that light uh, woodwind sort of solo there because the little surprises like this are all over this score. I certainly hope all those that tension there didn't put the listeners off. <laughs> it's sort of a startling way to start the piece, really. There are interesting sonorities and timbral combinations. In the first minute, flutes start glissando figures as the brass play ominously tense chords with crescendos on them. It's all very impressive. The brass have the thematic material here. When they finish... Music box-like metallic percussion is heard, so bear with this uh, movement, listeners. <laughs> There's some really uh, fantastic sounds in it, along with the crescendoing brass and swooping winds. Yervi pulls a lot of detail out of this highly detailed score with independent lines. Reinveta relies heavily on crescendoing sustained chords. He likes the crescendo. He uses this as an expressive element very often. At the 4 minute and 22 second mark, a wind theme emerges over pulsing pizzicato figures in the strings. We hear either a wind machine or some kind of rattled sheet, along with winds towards the 5th minute. The entire orchestra does a big crescendo for a peak moment just before the 6th minute, then the music does a quick decrescendo to silence. Brass come back with chords, strings start rushing upwards as at the beginning, and some big chords end the movement. Movement 2, track 2. Motion of waiting. This communicates decadent but seductive lethargy. That sentence describes my life, so I really <laughs> wanted to absorb this movement completely and see if it sort of reflected me. <laughs> anyway, I don't think it really did, but let's just sample the opening and think of me lying on a sofa <laughs> when you listen to this. Okay, seductive lethargy it may be, but it's not my seductive lethargy. Uh, so let's just keep with the narrative. Chirping flutes and gentle metallic percussion begin the movement. A series of phrases come next, out of which a skittering solo violin and flute emerge. This disappears, and we hear a single high wind chord in the distance. The strings come in with their low end warmth at a minute and 37 seconds, and rumbling percussion start a crescendo buildup that quickly climaxes. There's a solo cello at about the 2 minute and 5 second mark. By 3 minutes, crescendoing single chords come in waves. The segments are shaped via waves of great timbral combinations, and if one follows these shapes, the movement is comprehensible. A crescendo is reached and gives way to light wind patterns at 4 minutes and 45 seconds. Metallic percussion comes back at the end. Swooping strings take over the flute to end the movement, along with a final light metal percussion line. Track 3, Lack and Desire, communicates destructive ecstasy. Well, I haven't reached that level yet, <laughs> but I may be on my way. Be careful. Yeah. This begins ominously. Let's hear some ominousness.
there's sort of a rushing feeling to the rhythm too. Mm. It's really exciting. And we hear the gradual crescendo that Reinverer loves to use. There's woody percussion along with rolling strings and timpani. A solo violin in mid-line peeks out of the texture as if passing in a tornado. The percussion are pretty explosive. At a minute and 30 seconds, they start a pounding loud rhythm. The percussion decrescendo by 3 minutes and 15 seconds when they're more in the background but still pounding away barbarically. A long sustained harsh chord ends their dominance and makes way for a complex set of rhythms in various instruments at around the 3 minute and 40 second mark. There are really a lot of interesting sounds in this work. Pizzicato with a clapping percussion instrument dominate most of the fourth minute. A large crescendo heads to a chaotic climax at about the 6 minute and 20 second mark, followed by a quick decrescendo. Most of the music in this movement comes across with a heavy tread, including the forthright strings at the beginning of the seventh minute. Timpani also sternly accompany. The final percussive section is interrupted by a high, harsh wind chord, which is hammered down by a single percussion hit and unison brass blast. Okay, I want to mention about this piece. It does have a narrative quality to it, and you want to keep that in mind, and you want to keep in mind that the entire sound you know, timbral combinations of each section are going to just change. And that's kind of gives the feeling of the story, the scenery moving forward. So you want to follow those sort of changes of section. And it should sort of give you some kind of mental image of a kind of shadow play in your mind. It's a pretty interesting piece. Tracks four through five, concerto for two flutes, strings, and percussion. Now this is described in the notes as a delicately playful work. Hmm. Track four, movement one, it has a long description starting Civetando, and it starts with a spitting graded flute texture crescendoing in from silence. It's a single note at first, then starts gradually moving. Delicate it all is, but this doesn't sound playful to me at all. It's not my idea of playful. Anyway, we hear various flutes. It sounds like more than two but it could be two. Strings play eerie chords as the one flute trills from a minute and 30 seconds. The flutes come in with quick staccato patterns like bird sounds at around the three minute mark, and that's where I want to sample this particular movement. I think this work is playful in the same way that scientists are funny. You know, they have a sense <laughs> of humor, but it's not funny to me somehow. Anyway, I do like this piece a lot. It's, a, it's a, But I don't know about the word playful isn't really registering for me anyway. Swooping strings end the chirping flute section. There's a long solo section in the sixth and seventh minutes for the flutes, who never play legato, just sharp attacks, almost shrieking. At the 7 minute and 40 second mark, there's a very quiet section that sounds like a single violin tapping the strings with the bow. The single repeating sound grows into brief lines, all very quiet. I'm not going to bother to sample that. You won't hear it unless you're in a very quiet space, which is where you're going to want to be when you hear this recording, by the way, because there are a lot of beautiful sections that are very quiet. I had to strain to hear this section myself in my house because there was traffic outside. I'll have to use the headphones next time I hear this. We hear gongs after that, and the flutes come back with haunting sounds. The flutes come in in a lower register, playing quick, short staccato patterns, followed by silence, with the strings providing a light, shimmering bed. We hear gongs after that, and the flutes come back with haunting sounds. The flutes end the movement with long, sustained tones, and we hear gentle gongs under them, compelling timbres. Trek 5 also has a long list of tempo or mood sort of uh, instructions starting with a largo and then there's a cadenza. This starts with a wash of a single orchestral chord and here the flutes come out with solid sustained tones moving forward. Let's hear the opening of the second and final movement.
I like hearing music at this tempo in the year 2024 <laughs> because <laughs> everything is so fast and it's really just kind of make your mind slow down in order to connect the entire melody together. The flutes continue repeating their upward lines and the textures change as the orchestra becomes more involved from around the fourth minute as the flutes play more sustained tones. But that rising pattern is never far away. In the fifth minute, one of the flutes goes back to it. In the seventh minute, there's what I guess could be called a cadenza for the flutes who have the space to themselves. Towards the end of the seventh minute, the rising figure reestablishes itself momentarily. Then a chirping flute commentary follows. Crescendo at 9 minutes and 30 seconds or so leads to some breathy attacks on the now athletic flutes, one of which circles around staccato and breathily. The piece is fairly stationary as far as movement goes, just the flutes fluttering around while the orchestra remains put, like some giant iceberg. The timbral combinations are again remarkable, but the flutes draw the ear throughout this work. They're constantly moving around. In the last minute, the flutes move up high, still with that upward theme, except now they're close to the stratosphere. There are some cool sounds of the uh, breath shooting through the flute at the end. Track six, On the Ship of Fools, the title track. And this has an interesting theme to it, which I'm going to read from the booklet notes. It's a haunting, but atmospherically tantalizing scherzo. So it's sort of a musical joke in a way. Though labeled a scherzo, it is not a musical joke, the notes say. Rather an eerie vision. The work is inspired by the novel The Ship of Fools by Sebastian Brandt, written at the turn of the 16th century, <laughs> a long time ago, mm -hmm. shortly before Erasmus of Rotterdam's In Praise of Folly. The central statement in the book is Mundus vult decipi ergo decipiator, which is Latin for The world wants to be deceived, so let us deceive it. Boy, this could have been written yesterday. In times of fake news, conspiracy theories, and contempt for science, this motto does not seem to have aged, according to the booklet notes. If I may add, by the way, this is the reason why you want to have a firm knowledge of the humanities. The past, as we're seeing here, often explains the present, and often offers solution to modern issues, too, that we wouldn't otherwise think of. So, get to work on those philosophy, literature, <laughs> and music books, and keep listening to music, too. Back to the recording. Some of the structural elements communicating the work's theme is superficial bustle, such as the solo violin, in a leaden calm or a cursory silence under which the percussion rumbles. Sleepwalkers stagger into danger or distract themselves from making important decisions. This really does sound like today, doesn't it? The work starts in a harmonic haze with sustained sounds, quiet and ominous. A very slow, low, then high pulse emerges. Then by a minute and 36 seconds, we have active flutes leaping around. This would be part of the superficial bustle Reinwerder mentions in his explanation. At 2 minutes and 15 seconds, the violin starts a similar leaping, active line. It's rather distant in the overall sound. No single instrument sounds up front, as is right in a non-concerto symphonic work. The work consists of subtly shifting orchestral textures with occasional identifiable solo sounds emerging briefly from it. It's hard to know what to sample, but I want to give an overall view. So let's hear something from 4 minutes and 15 seconds. We'll even hear the superficial violin line emerging from the ominous murk. And listen to the violin line and how empty it is. He manages to remove all content from it, so it just seems like it's just pointlessly leaping around in this environment. So this is a highly atmospheric work. 
Percussion emerged at around 5 minutes and 45 seconds. There's a pulsing set of sticks and more melodic timpani in the background. For a while, the percussion is all we hear. And I want to sample that, too, because I thought this was a remarkable moment in this score. Reinveta seems to come up with these pretty often. Again, these um, sort of percussion sounds are light and they're not propulsive. They're just sort of there taking up space. It's kind of interesting. At the 7 minute and 50 second mark, a more woody percussion sound is heard and strings start gentle crescendos on single sets of tones. The restless violin reemerges at about the midway point, a build up in waves of volume, sounding like waves crashing on the shore, build up in the orchestra and percussion. They suddenly stop and more quiet tones are heard with wispy short string lines in the background. Short shivering string figures open the way to pulsing winds in the 11th minute. By the 13th minute, we have a single quivering string line and odd texture, very interesting. There's also a very light muted trumpet in the mix. Meanwhile, the orchestra builds up again and another wave crashes strongly at 14 minutes and 20 seconds. The watery sounds here surely have to do with the work's title, Ship of Fools, though no sort of water is mentioned in the description. The orchestra calms and we hear an English horn, the solo violin line, and sustained wind chords building up to higher pitches. At 16 minutes and 42 seconds, the background orchestra has disappeared and we just hear the thin-toned solo violin skittering around. The orchestra eventually comes back as the violin continues its skittering ways. It builds up chords in a manner the winds did earlier. There's a clear, spacious chord at 19 minutes and 15 seconds, sustained to the end of the work and doing a natural fade at the end. These are works that are based on timbre and rhythm, and also orchestral effects like crescendos, which Reinvada seems to favor. But those combined orchestral timbres have a sound that I've come to associate with Eastern Europe in general, and Estonia in particular, particularly through Erkis Ventur's works. Reinvada seems to use certain timbral combinations thematically in a section of music. Then he'll go off into a different set of tonal colors to continue his tonal narrative. The most subtle, but easily comprehensible, use of this approach is in the title work On the Ship of Fools, in which the orchestra appears in all seriousness, while the instruments that emerge solo play relative banality. Reinvada is a composer who uses contrast a lot. The works are all atmospheric, particularly the playful, you have that in quotation marks, playful, concerto for two flutes, strings, and percussion. And while ominous, the works put me in a solemn mood. I enjoyed them, but not in any kind of soothing or relaxing way. They're intellectual and make one sit up and think. These scores are in ideal hands with Pavo Yervi. He's on top of every nuance in each of these scores, and that's what makes this music register for the first-time listener so well. The music is dramatic, but has a lot of slow, quiet sections with an exquisite beauty of sound to them, and Yervi balances all of this beautifully. I don't know, these Estonian composers all have unique musical ideas. Is there something in the water there? Or maybe in the music schools? I don't know, but I was really compelled by this album. I found Ryan Vedder's music enigmatic and brooding. There's not much conventional melody in it, but his harmonic language is thick and interesting. Mostly I enjoyed the layers of timbres and interesting use of sections of the orchestra. The music has a lot of contrasts and a very unpredictable nature, which made it engaging and suspenseful for me to follow through to the end, never knowing what's going to happen as it flows along. So yeah, very unique approach and use of different techniques to create some kind of narrative in the music here. Yeah, this is one of those albums that I'm definitely going to go back to and just listen to without having to think of what I'm going to say about it on the podcast, you know, because <laughs> I don't feel like experience. I've really just, yeah, I haven't really just kind of just let it play for me, you know what right. I mean, without having to think about it. So I have to do that next. 
Okay, over on the jazz side, I've got a program with a lot of variety and some really great recordings this time. We're going to start out with a guitar trio plus, and that's called Minor Operation. It's on Jojo Records by Amos Hoffman. Amos Hoffman is an Israeli-born jazz guitarist and oud player. He started playing guitar at age six and came to the Oud later. He studied at the Rubin Academy of Music in Jerusalem, and he spent time in Amsterdam and then New York, and now he's based in South Carolina. His five previous recordings as a leader, The Dreamer from 1999, Naama 2006, Evolution 2008, Carving 2010, and then his previous recording, Back to the City 2015, He's also recorded as a sideman with Abishai Cohen and others. On this recording, Hoffman's on guitar in Oud. Santi Debriano on upright bass, who we've heard on the podcast before. Back in episode 91, Low String Theory, we heard his recording Ashanti. We like that a lot. And mm. on this recording, we've got Lenny White on drums, who we heard most recently in episode 150, Music a la Modo. <laughs> That's a good title. It was. Yeah. With Gerald Cannon's recording live at Dizzy's Club, the music of Elvin and McCoy. Okay, the recording's going to get started with a Hoffman original, Aunt Sharon. This has a melody line of interval jumps over chords. It's a repeating 16-measure idea. You'll hear a figure in the first four measures, and then it gets modulated in the next eight-measure section. Then the idea repeats. Hoffman's guitar tone is warm yet clear. Let's hear this album get going. an eight measure ending section and it gets a more driving pulse for a while from Debriano with subdivided drums but also gets more of the halting type phrasing from the beginning before Hoffman works into more flowing and sometimes speedy improvised lines mixed with chords let's hear some of his licks on this tune a little bit further on Debriano has a melodic bass solo with a big tone and nice dexterity on this tune as well. We hear the melody section again, and Hoffman has a dreamy, meandering ending with a little bowed bass added by Debriano. I like the relaxed sense of space in this tune and White's light and minimalist drumming. Track 2, another Hoffman original minor operation, the title track. It's a minor 12-bar blues with stop time and a swinging 8-measure bridge. It feels great. Let's hear it. Thank you. 
After the melody, Hoffman continues on soloing and gets into some cool double stops, mixing things up with bluesy licks, speedy lines, and chords over a nice bass chug from Debriano. Let's check out the end of his solo into Debriano's bass solo. Hoffman comes back for some trading fours with White before they get back to the blues and bridge sections. This is timeless and tasty stuff here. Track three, another Hoffman original, Hidden Garden. Get in the mood for Oud now, Mike. A cool yeah. modal Oud melody over bowed bass. It's got a six-beat feel in an AAB form. The A sections are 10 measures and the B longer at 12. When it repeats, White joins in on light tom backing. Let's hear it get going. comes to the end of that section, there's a pause, and then it gets a new syncopated section with great oud and bass interaction into some oud soloing with neat tremolos. Let's hear some of that as well. Debriano has a great bass groove going on, and Hoffman continues on to a cool rhythmic finishing line. Next, we get a little standards sandwich meet in the middle of this recording with the next two tunes, starting with All Alone, an Irving Berlin tune from 1924, which was introduced during the post-Broadway tour of the third annual Music Box Review. This is a slow waltz. It's a 32-measure melody that has a kind of lonesome cowboy feel here. They play through the tune straight once, and then Hoffman has improvisations for a second time around, getting back to the melody on the way. Let's hear a little bit of his gentle ideas on this one from about a minute and 25 seconds in. <laughs> Thank you. 
sense of space in his playing on this tune. Track 5, Sammy Kahn's I Should Care, a famous standard from 1944. The 32-measure melody has similar halves with different endings. I like the light bounce in Debriano's bass. Let's check it out into the solo break for Hoffman. <laughs> Next time they go around, he gets a break again, and this time Debriano has more of a chugging walk, and Hoffman gets into some nice chord soloing before some speedy lines. Let's check out some of Debriano's solo on this tune a little bit further on. melodic and rhythmic ideas and Hoffman is back from there to trade some fours with white they get back to the melody and Hoffman has some fun on a final coda section track six a Hoffman original the three of us this starts out as a kind of rubato dialogue between oud and bass with drum textures from white let's hear it get going <laughs> conversation continues and later in the tune they get into a hypnotic beat with some cool oud improvisations so let's hear a little bit of that part of the tune later on Thank you. 
That's the end of it there. Trek 7, A Day in Mardin. Turkey, that is. And this one's a lot of fun. Hoffman has recorded tracks with both guitar and oud on the modal melody. It sounds like a 24 measure repeating melody. Let's check this out. goes into a little arpeggiated transition section there, and Debriano has a bass solo that really bursts out. Let's hear this one. Hoffman gets a guitar solo with a forward rhythmic drive, and Wet gets some time on this one too, working around the kit while Hoffman keeps the shape with chords. They get back to the oud and guitar melody to wrap it up. This tune was a lot of fun. And the recording ends up with a Hoffman original, T-L-I-S-C. Don't know what it stands for. Maybe he'll let us know. This is a rhythm changes based tune with Hoffman taking an improvised round over the chords first before they get to the melody with Debriano joining in. Let's check it out. Continue on soloing playfully, and Debriano has an energetic solo too, but let's hear White's drum solo on this tune. Thank you. 
Yeah, I like the tom pitches in his solo there. And Hoffman is back to take it to the end, as you can hear from there. And that's the recording. I really enjoyed it. In the slower numbers, Hoffman has a great sense of space in his playing, and White gives a lot of room with sparse drumming. Things get rhythmic and exciting in spots, pushed by Debriano's strong pulsing bass lines. Hoffman's originals have variety, from a classic blues with a bridge to modal oud tunes that the trio lock in together on. Hoffman has a rich but clear tone, and his solos are creative, with a balance of fluid and fast lines, double stops and chords. Intriguing oud solos, too. Debriano has melodic solos with great tone, and White's drumming is light in spots, but brings on the accents when things get busy with a few solo spots to shine through. These three have good synergy, and the program with the standards in the middle of originals and oud adventures kept me pulled in. You know, I thought this album showed exquisite taste in all of the playing. It's just really... Yeah. It drew me, yeah. And also the sound quality was fantastic, too, especially on the uh, guitar. It's a really full sound and mm -hmm. really right up close. I really just wanted to melt into it. It was great. We get a microscopic sample of the guitar's tone on the album... And the oud was given more space, I thought, in the acoustic, which served it really well. Mm. The tracks are well varied. They turn on the charm. The bass thumps out a few solos. The drums tap them out when they come. He, he likes to like, accent his hits. He's not really a hard-hitting drummer, is he? Everything is so attractively played, and the guitar playing was so even and full tone that it could only be appealing. Yeah. I like the three tracks with the oud, an instrument that I feel makes space for some interesting jazz arrangements, as it does here. Two of these are specifically go into Arab modes, but even sections of those have like a Western feel to them. Mm -hmm. It could be like a Western mode as well. An interesting album and a little taste of the Middle East is the spice. Yeah, it makes it stand out. All right, get your seat belts out for the next recording. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> and all pianists, take out your notebook. We're going to go to a trio here. Antonio Farao tributes on the crisscross Jazz label came out June 14th. On this recording, we've got Antonio Farrao on piano, the great John Patitucci on bass, and also the great Jeff Ballard on drums, who's played with Chick Corea, Pat Metheny, Joshua Redmond, Kurt Rosenwinkel, and Brad Meldau, among others. Antonio Farrao was born in Rome in 1965. He earned a degree in 1983 from Giuseppe Verdi Conservatory in Milan, and performed in clubs as a teenager. His debut recording Black Inside in 1999 was recorded with Ira Coleman and Jeff Tane Watts, who we heard last week. And he's recorded with Bob Berg, Andre Ciccarelli, Jack DeJohnette, Joe Lovano, among others. And he has more than a dozen recordings as a leader. His influences range from Herbie Hancock, Chick Corea, McCoy Tyner, Keith Jarrett, Bill Evans, and Kenny Kirkland, as well as more classic names such as Oscar Peterson, Errol Garner, and Lenny Tristano. From the crisscross Jazz Notes, Farrao says, quote, I like to play in the straight-ahead way, but at the same time be open, out of the box. Playing this way allows me freedom, and this rhythm section knows how to manage that dimension. I don't think about anything when I play. I try to follow the line. When you start thinking is when you make a mistake. You should play natural, live yourself, form the way. When I compose, my inspiration is usually from the past when I was a teenager. It's rare that I'm inspired by the future. And about this recording, he says, in this new project, I wanted to pay tribute to some great musicians who over the years have given me strong artistic and human emotions, as well as some places like Calvi, where I had the opportunity to meet other formidable musicians of the French jazz scene, including the great Didier Lockwood and Michel Petrucciani, to whom I dedicate Memories of Calvi. This recording was recorded July 26, 2023 in Paris. Engineer Julien Bassaret and Michael Marciano on editing, mixing, and mastering. Producer Jerry Teekins, he's the executive producer, and co-producer Christophe Besson of Alvarium Holding. The recording gets underway with the title track, Tributes, a Pharrell original. This has a catchy piano melody riff and an uplifting feel. 
Ballard's dancing cymbals give it a sense of graceful forward movement over Patitucci's snappy bass. The melody is in an A-A-B-A form of 16 measure sections. The B section is a bit softer in contrast. Let's hear this one get going. But I was off improvising, and he bursts out with ideas over furious bass walking from Patitucci. Listen for his darting left hand figures, too. Let's come back for a bit more of his soloing later on in the tune. you needed a seatbelt for this one that, that is some complicated uh music amazing right yeah. there <laughs> and patatucci follows from there with a bass solo that has reaching lines and for hours back to trade eights with ballard before a couple times through the a section of the melody exciting and played with a lot of finesse track two is also a Farrell original right one another catchy piano melody with a kind of wistful feeling and a recurring riff Clean dancing cymbals again from Ballard, and Patitucci has ringing bass intervals. There's an eight measure intro and a repeating 14 measure melody section. Let's take a listen. Farao's off improvising, and his long lines are smooth and connected. He breaks things up with choppy rhythmic chord ideas and spots, and his ideas come out like a fountain. He ends it up in a gentle trickle into a bass solo from Patitucci. So let's hear that into some of his solo. Thank you. 
great melodic ideas and clear articulation in John Patitucci's bass solos. They go around the melody sections again with an ending that ripples over the full range of the piano. Track three is another Farao original shock. This tune has a more ominous atmosphere and shows that Farao doesn't need much to launch off from into interesting ideas. Farao introduces a bass line of G, A flat, E, F sharp that Paratucci picks up and Farao is off on an adventure. Let's hear it get going. Off swinging in high gear from there. And let's check out the ending of Farao's piano solo into some drum work from Ballard from about four minutes in. Well, they bring back the bass line from before under the still skittering drums and push it to the end with more piano ideas. Track four, time for a standard Cole Porter's I Love You from his stage musical Mexican Hayride in 1944. Farrell starts it out solo on the piano with a nice bounce, making sure that you remember the melody before flying free with improvised ideas. Patitucci and Ballard have a really great synergy, working in and out of a walking groove to match Farao's rhythmic direction. Let's jump in a bit to check out that interaction around three minutes into the tune. Patitucci gets a bass solo on this one too, and they give the melody a straighter exposition at the end, and the ending improvisations are really cool with some two-handed piano lines and unwinding bass figures. Let's hear this one end up.
Right, track five is a Farao original tender. It's a ballad and it shows off the tender side of Farao's playing. It's a pretty longing melody in an AABA shape, but with unusual phrase lengths. The A sections are seven measures plus an extra measure of two beats, and the B is six measures. Farao starts off the A sections alone with rubato piano phrasing that pushes forward and bass and drums come in on the B. I'll leave you to check out the melody yourself. Let's jump in from the start of Farao's flowing improvisations about a minute and a half in. Patitucci has a great ringing bass solo over the A sections, and Farao is back from the B to finish off the melody to a slowed down false ending, and then more improvisations over a relaxed vamp for a couple more minutes. Really lovely playing. Track 6, MT. It's a Farao original, and one listen, and you'll know that must be McCoy Tyner. The intro is rubato with little three-note piano phrases that lead into modal minor ripples on the keyboard. Ballard starts tracing out a beat that will set the groove for bass and rhythmic piano chords. I'll let this run a little bit long so you can hear it transition. This gets really exciting with driving left-hand chords and endless ideas in Farao's solo. Let's check out a little bit more of it. This just keeps pushing on with the piano solo until things finally dissipate to a final drum punctuation. Track 7 is Memories of Calvi, which is on the island of Corsica in France. 
This is a happy sounding melody with a kind of light Latin-y beat. After a 16 measure intro with a bass ostinato, the melody is long at 50 measures and has a cool little bass and left hand piano line from the 32nd bar. Let's take a listen to the beginning. On the melody twice, and then Farao's improvisations are bubbling and joyful and keep pushing ahead. Things come down softer for a final time through the melody and an outro with the ostinato idea from the beginning. Track 8 is a Farao composition, Syrian Children. It's a solo piano piece. After a meandering intro, the minor melody evokes sadness and has a classical nature to it. Farao's left hand keeps a sense of rhythmic tension under his improvisations and I like how the ending unfolds in gentle chiming notes. I'm going to go for a sample of the ending here. Yeah, this is a very touching piece. Track 9, a Fara original, song for shorter, Wayne Shorter, that must be. This tune is unique with a loping six-beat feel and a bass ostinato that ends with some harmonic tension. There's a six-measure intro and a repeating 14-measure sparse piano melody. Let's hear it get going. After the second time around, the ostinato ends and it floats loosely for Farao's improvisations with cymbal decorations from Ballard and pushing bass lines. Let's check out Patatucci's ringing melodic bass solo on this tune. Thank you. 
back to the ostinato and melody section from there. It's a very pensive composition. And the recording ends up with track 10, Matrix, a Chick Corea tune from his 1968 recording, Now He Sings, Now He Sobs. If you know the original Korea version, you'll get a smile from Farao's little rising flourishes at the beginning. It really gets off to a speedy swing faster than the original as Farrell gets his improvisations going. Let's hear it get started. with ideas on this one and let's come back in and hear a little bit more later on. Tucci has a solo on this one as well with high speed melodic ideas and very cool double stops, so don't miss that. And Ballard gets to unwind on this as well before they get back to the quirky fun melody to finish up. And that's the recording. It seems Antonio Farao has unlimited imagination and energy to express his ideas. This recording has many wow moments in his solos. His compositions have catchy melodic phrases, and many of them become familiar soon. There's a lot of modern modal explosive playing here, but it's balanced with more nuanced and lyrical work on tender and Syrian children. And we get one standard and one Chick Korea tune. It's an engaging program. Patitucci is great as always with evolving grooves and engaging solos. And Ballard is a drummer with a lot of finesse. I was constantly drawn to his cymbals tracing out subdivisions and textures and how he can let things hang loose or drive really hard depending on what's called for. We've heard a lot of great pianists on the Adult Music Podcast, and I would say that Antonio Farrell ranks at the top of the most exciting players I've heard. Yeah, I was struck by the piano playing right away, too, right from the first track. This is fantastic piano playing, and it's really interesting, too. There's a lot mm. of nuance to it as well. If you listen in really closely, there are a lot of, like, just these little, I don't know how to explain it, rhythmic kind of little elements to the line that's yeah you know just unexpected like we'll go into one rhythm and then come right out and go to another one he doesn't keep to one rhythmic idea for long even within like lines that he's playing and it just brings a new dimension to his interpretations and it makes for an exciting album i like what he did also between the two hands too there was some rhythmic stuff going oh, yeah. on there things yeah really great he also has impressively even scales too if he wants to do that a skill which he shows off pretty often on the album John Patitucci is in on this too, and he takes a similar rhythmically varied approach sort of in his solos. And that all adds to some really pleasant surprises musically, just in yeah. the ensemble and even in the solos. It feels like the listeners, us, and anyone listening to this record is discovering something along with the trio themselves. Like we're all sort of finding it out at the same time, except yeah. that the recording is already made. The album sticks to tradition but leans towards an intellectual approach. Yeah, it might be too much for some listeners, but I found it really exciting. Yeah. 
Yeah, I found this exhilarating is a good word for this album, too. I was really kind of in a really elevated state, I guess, once it was over. I thought it got more demanding as it went. I guess uh, they were leading us into you know higher planes of existence as the <laughs> record goes on. Uh, it gets more abstract in tracks eight and nine and is absolutely racing in you know, the Chick Corea tune, Matrix. Right. But it's great and compelling all the way through. And I must have this on a CD. Yeah. Yeah, I want it to. <laughs> You yeah. really get to feel what he talks about playing in the moment, that mm -hmm. he's really internalized what he needs yeah. to do. And so he's ready to just let it come out. And you're there for that creation. And he's never second guessing himself. The music comes through with full confidence that it could only be that way. And that's what a great solo should be like. Right. All right. Well, now we're going to put aside the uh, intellectual leanings and get down and dirty <laughs> with some great soulful playing here. This is a recording I was waiting for for a while when I knew it was coming out, and I've been listening to it for the last week or so yeah, and really too. enjoying it. Yeah. And this is called Soul Jazz on Smoke Sessions Records. It came out June 14th. The group is a jazz supergroup. They're calling themselves something else, exclamation point. Jazz fans will know where that comes from. We'll talk about that later. And it's featuring the great alto saxophonist Vincent Herring. From the Smoke Sessions Records description of this recording, Vincent Herring says, quote, This project represents the music that we love, music that just feels great. Everybody in the band grew up on soul jazz where the feeling was paramount. The music of the day was soul and R&B. That's what my parents played on the stereo when they were in the car or when they would have gatherings. So I think it's a feeling that we were all craving in our own music. And the notes also say the band's name, of course, is borrowed from something else, the classic 1958 Cannonball Adderley album. And Adderley and his brother Nat can both be counted among the architects of soul jazz. And Herring enjoyed deep ties to both. He toured and recorded for nearly a decade with Nat Adderley following his brother's death and went on to form the Cannonball Adderley legacy band with drummer Louis Hayes. So on the recording, Vincent Herring alto saxophone, Wayne Escoffery on tenor saxophone, Jeremy Pelt on trumpet, Paul Bolenbach on guitar, David Kikoski on piano, Essiet Essiet on bass, and Otis Brown III on drums. It's a real all-star lineup. Man. Indeed. <laughs> and the recording is going to get underway with a Horace Silvertune, Filthy McNasty. <laughs> That's from his 1961 doing the thing at the village gate recording there's a great horn arrangement on this one there's an eight measure intro and then it's a 12 bar blues around twice listen to how the first time through kikowski's piano chords answer the trumpet and tenor riff and the second time it's guitar and alto sax and then mr herring is launched into the blues let's hear it get going <laughs> sax solo and pelt follows with the first of many exciting trumpet solos on the recording so let's check him out on this one as well Thank you. 
Yeah. Well, Scoffrey is next, and you know, I've been listening to him for years, going back to his recordings with Tom Harrell. We've heard his solo release on the podcast before. I've always thought of him as a really smooth player, but I really like the extra grease he gets on his solo here. And Kikoski has a really swinging, bouncy piano solo that has some harmonic fun, too. The piano tone on the recording has kind of an old-time sound to it as well. The horns come back with the new blues melody like the original tune, and then the intro lick idea for an outro. But they stretch it out with the rhythm section and some fills from Brown, adding final syncopated horn lines to the ending. Track 2, Too Blue, from Stanley Turrentine's 1973 Don't Mess With Mr. T. Now, the original had Rhodes on it and organ, too. Here, Kikoski gets the minor 12-bar blues tune going with a round on acoustic piano with the rhythm section. The first time around, the melody, Escoffery's tenor, and Bolenbach take the melody. And on the repeat, Pelt and Herring get answering lines. And we can hear up to a little bit of that, so let's check out the beginning of the tune. gets the first solo here on guitar. His phrasing is really chilled out, and that goes well with his dark, slightly reverby tone. The horns come in for backing lines on his last chorus to cheer him along, and Herring is next, starting with a slow burn and a great searing tone. Escoffrey has a great solo on this one with lots of grease working up to some angsty cries, so let's check that out. I think I need a napkin after that solo. <laughs> nice tremolos under him there from Kikoski, who's up next for a subtle solo working up to some percussive chords. What follows is a little nod to the Adderleys with some quotes from Nat's work song into some fills from Brown. It's a nice touch, and they connect it back to a final time through the melody with some last phrase repeats to wrap it up. Track three, Mean Greens by saxophonist Eddie Harris. This is from his Mean Greens album from 1966. This one has the same cool horn intro like the original, and then gets into that little boogaloo feel. In the original, there's 16 measures of rhythm section with modulation like the melody, but here they keep it to just eight before the 16 measure horn melody, and then Herring is off on a solo. Let's check it out. Mm-hmm. 
are back with the fun angular new horn lines that recall the intro, just like on the original tune. Pelt has a trumpet solo with lots of sass, and Escoffery gets a go too before the horn lines are back. Then Bollenbach and Kikoski get their shots, so let's hear what they have to say on this one. trails on with some vamping to the end. Track four, The Chicken. This is by Pee Wee Ellis, a tenor saxophonist who co-wrote and arranged a lot of James Brown's classic hits. And this was an instrumental on Brown's 1969 recording, The Popcorn. Like the original, Essiot gives this a throbbing bass line to drive it along. There's a 16-measure intro, then the cool 24-measure horn melody that has a nice harmonic twist in the 13th measure. The horns continue with a riff over the vamp for eight measures, and Herring is up first for a solo. You know you want to hear it, so let's check it out. will come back in on the final vamp section to push him on and then Pelt is up for a trumpet solo and the horns again come back into solos from Escoffery and Bollenbach. Kikoski has some cool two-hand lines into funky fun on this one so let's check out a little bit of that as well. finish it up. Track 5, Herbie Hancock's Driftin'. This is from his 1962 Blue Note debut, Taken Off. Now the original had Freddie Hubbard on trumpet and Dexter Gordon on saxophone. It's a fun 32 measure melody, basically in an A-A-B-A form with fun pauses. The horns have the first A section and then guitar and piano take the repeat. I'll leave you to check it out. I keep cutting off Vincent Herring's solos, so I want to jump right to his solo and let him keep blowing on this one. Thank you. 
Holt has a playful solo next, and then Escoffery with some horn backing lines for his solo. Kikoski has a rollicking solo too, before a final time through the melody and a cute coda ending different from the original. Track 6, Slow Drag. This is a Donald Byrd tune from his 1967 album of the same name. They take this slower than the original. Like the original though, it takes a while to build up from a vamp into the horn melody. Let's jump in to where the horns come in a little bit into the tune. Pairing solos first, keeping it simple and real, and then letting some double time licks rip out. Pelt has a great bluesy solo here that builds up and has some half valve sassiness, and we'll check him out on the next tune. So let's hear Dave Kikoski's tasty licks on this one. it up. Track 7, Strasbourg St. Denis by Roy Hargrove. This is from his 2008 recording Ear Food. Like the original, it gets started over a bass groove into the uplifting melody. They do it pretty much like Hargrove's original version, so I'll leave you to check out the melody. Here, I'll sample Pelt's solo that captures a lot of Hargrove's spirit with some of his signature licks and intervals he used a lot in his solos. I'm sure you recognize it if you know his playing. So let's take a listen.
have solos on this one as well. And the recording is going to end up with a tune that surprised me when I saw the track list because I wondered how this was going to fit into the soul program because the original, as all jazz fans will know, is slow, stark, and serene. And that's John Coltrane's Naima from his 1960s Giant Steps recording. But you can find earlier versions of it on recordings out now as well. And this track is on the CD and digital download as a bonus track and streaming as well, but not on vinyl. Well, it's a whole new bag here with a funky bass groove and popping drumming from Brown, and it works well. Herring starts out the melody, getting some horn harmonies with muted trumpet added from Pelt, and Escoffery takes over the melody on tenor. Let's hear this get going. keep going on and get some fun and funky syncopation and let's check out one final solo from Vincent Herring on this tune. It's a Harmon muted solo on this with snappy rhythmic lines, and then it comes to a sudden pause before Kikoski gets it going again with some gospely piano into a more driving groove from Bolenbach to rip out an edgy toned guitar solo that gets backing horn lines, and then Kikoski has a fun and funky extended piano solo too. I see it really has the bass lines popping below, and they take it through a final melody section to a sudden ending. This is an instantly enjoyable recording, and as a matter of fact, if you don't like this, I suggest you seek medical attention immediately. <laughs> it's a great collection of classic soul jazz tunes from the 60s right up to this new century. They mostly keep the spirit of the originals while featuring the unique expressions of these top New York jazz players. Cool three-horn arrangements, working in the guitar line skillfully as well. Some of our favorite soloists, Vincent Herring, Jeremy Pelt, Dave Kikoski, Wayne Escoffery, everyone's having a good time, and you will too. The soul-soaked atmosphere even transforms Coltrane's Naima into something new and funky. This was a great idea for a recording, and I consider it a big success. Yeah, this might be a test for like AI. If AI <laughs> hears this and doesn't have any feelings, then you know it's AI. It's not a person. Yeah, it's an all-star lineup, and they serve up a record of great grooves that go really to the roots of jazz, not just like these old things, and really of American music too. Yeah. 
Most of these are in a bluesy or kind of a gospel style. They're really the same thing, really. Just two sides of the same coin. As always, I enjoyed Kikoski's playing throughout. And uh, on this album, especially his bluesy chords on Driftin', and mm. he has like a honky-tonk style at the end of Naima that I liked a lot when the guitar solo comes in. Bolenbach on guitar has a clean sound for the most part, but dirties it up for the long lines when he plays distorted. And forget about it with the scoffery, herring, and pelt as the brass section, all individual, and they all sound great together. Yeah, there are all sorts of traditional American styles on the album, and I loved it for that, as well as for the playing and just the great grooves. For me, the chicken stood out for its funky groove, but really, I just liked all the grooves. I just thought that was yeah. really surprising. This album, it grooves a lot, and for me, that's what makes it quintessentially American. We are a part of the world that grooves. Yeah. It's a great record, probably one of my favorites of the year. I think this will be on both of our year-end lists. Yeah, it's probably just will. Too, yeah, <laughs> inevitable. It's yeah, it's pretty inevitable. All right, there you have it. That's episode one hundred and seventy. A bunch of great recordings with a lot of variety, and I think you should check them all out in full. And you better hurry up because we've got some more for you for next week in episode <laughs> we one seventy one. And so, what's on the classical menu for next week, Mike? I've got my normal lineup of Baroque, in between Baroque and Contemporary and then Contemporary. So I've got uh, Books to Hood in Baroque. He's mm. got a, uh, his, some of his trios. We've got another Da Vinci Classics release, uh, piano music by Ernesto Lecuona, the Cuban composer of the 20th mm. century, and Luis Moreau Gottschalk, an American composer from New Orleans from the 19th century. And they had highly rhythmic and highly kind of rootsy piano music. It's kind of more like entertainment music, but it's kind of, it's really unique, I think. And uh, for the contemporary composer, we have a, a French composer's uh, piano trios. That is uh, Jean-Charles Gondriel. We'll hear some of his piano trios, which are, I wouldn't say impressionistic. They're, they, they're kind of romantic and mm -hmm. sort of in a familiar mode, let's say. Okay. Uh, so I think we'll enjoy those too. Great. On the jazz side, it's going to be all trumpet. There's three new recordings I really want to listen to, starting with one I just found yesterday, a new release from the great Italian trumpeter Fabrizio Bosso. It's a duo with a pianist, and so I'm looking forward to checking that out. And then we've got on OA2, Stanko's Time from Anthony Stanko and Jared Hall's Influences on Origin label. All three of those recordings just came out on Friday the 21st, wow. and so they'll be all freshly squeezed trumpet music, and <laughs> I just can't wait to hear those. If you want to get started listening to those recordings, they'll be up on our Deezer playlist a few hours after this episode is published, and you can find a link to that on our Facebook page as well. Any final words, Mike? If you want to set a mood, play an ood. <laughs> <laughs> All right, as always, thanks to Fast Signs of Staten Island for our glowing neon logo. Don't forget to check out the Same Difference Two Jazz Fans, One Jazz Standard Podcast. Their promos coming up as soon as we sign off here. We'll see you again for episode 171 next week. And until then, keep listening and we'll see you again next time. Same Difference Two Jazz Fans, One Jazz Standard. A review of a single jazz standard through music, history, and stories. And this is AJ. And this is Johnny. If you are a jazz fan and you like jazz standards, bebop, show tunes, ballads, you name it. Yeah, we've got them here. We drop a new show on you every other week, and we take a standard, and we listen to a few different versions of it. Same difference. Come join the fun. Looking forward to seeing you.